Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The atmosphere is so charged and um, it's going to be a challenge given the, the topic that will define the direction of our proceedings tonight. So it's important that we calm it down a bit so that we can do a little bit of Bible study. If we flow with the euphoria of the atmosphere, we will be distorted from the present emphasis that the Holy Ghost wants to bring to us in the course of this meeting. So you have to pardon me to calm it down a bit. Hallelujah. <laughs> I want to quickly appreciate the leadership of the engineering students for having me here in APU Zaria. <laughs> It's a great honor, and I don't take it for granted. <laughs> Thank you, I love you too. <laughs> it's a great honor, it's a great honor. And um, honestly, I don't take it for granted. I want to appreciate the ministers that have come up earlier. Thank you so much for blessing us with the presence of God. Tonight, we will we'll pray. We'll take our time to pray. We'll stretch a bit in the spirit and trust the Lord to see what he would do in our midst. Can you just lift your hands toward heaven and talk to the Lord very briefly? This is the time where you separate from the crowd. The Bible said they go from strength to strength. Every one of them that appeared in Zion before the Lord. Strength in the kingdom is a function of appearance in the presence. A man that does not understand the mystery, the technology and the systems of appearing in the presence is a man that will faint in the day of battle because his strength will be small. The economy of strength in the kingdom is fabricated in your ability to stand in the presence. They say they go from strength to strength. You can be locked up, you can be lost in the congregation, but you will not make appearance in Zion. Can you whisper from the very depths of your heart. Talk to Jesus tonight. That he may find you in the midst of the crowd. The Bible said, Bartimaeus cried out. And he stopped the protocol. Jesus had to locate him. Do you know how to cry? Some of us have mastered a lot of things, but we don't know how to apprehend the master. Come on. Kambra safa tebelege parash. Kariana tabra sebelana tragadia suvri nahas. Kamilu rahambre skabadia saliandra paras. Zedelega para bandra zedesh. Ambre sekete palababrumbro sapararas. Kamala kabaska palababaska ba. Lift your voice toward heaven. Call upon the name of the Lord. Not in matches, not in beats. Your engagement of the spirit realm for yourself. You can sit under mighty anointings. You can be imparted by great men of God. But if you don't engage the spirit realm for yourself, brother, you can't travel far. And that's where many of us lack strength. We see men, we are excited, but we can't touch the Holy Ghost. Come on, you want to talk to God tonight? Come on, you want to talk to God tonight? You reign, you ancient Zion's king. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You reign, 
you ancient Zion's king. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your, you reign, you reign, you reign. over this territory that have been built by the prophecies of the fathers. We align ourselves with the utterances of the patriarchs that have walked the borders of this land. We latch onto the covenants that they caught with you and the promises that they received on account of faithfulness. And even as we look up to you tonight, Lord, we ask that you will reign upon us bounties of your presence that sustains the capacity to transform us for good so that the texture of our service in the kingdom will be one that will pass the taste of the immortals. Thank you Holy Spirit in Jesus precious name. You may be seated. God bless you. Oh my God. God bless you. You know, whenever you have the privilege to enter a territory that is rich, that is so blessed with spiritual resources, you understand that you are walking a terrain where the counsel of God is always looming in the atmosphere. And oftentimes the crisis of the believer is his inability to satisfy the requirements of alignment. 
you would wonder why a man will walk with Jesus for three years and that man will pass the test of becoming the son of perdition. It defies our understanding of the doctrine of transformation. Because captured in the doctrine of transformation are three cardinal spiritual resources that are responsible for orchestrating transformation in the soul of a man. One of it is the word of the Lord. The truth of his kingdom. When a man begins to interface with the word of the Lord sufficiently, it is natural for his system, his design, his makeup, to begin to respond to the energy of that life. And transformation becomes a natural reality. So he said, we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in the glass, the image of the Lord, we are changed. How then will a man walk with Jesus, hearing the very spoken word of God for three years, and then transformation is not a possibility in his life? It draws our attention to the fact that in this kingdom, you don't make progress only by what God has to supply. There is a responsibility requirement for every believer in order to walk into the full heritage of God. Another spiritual resource that is responsible for transformation is the presence of God. And the Bible said concerning Jesus that he was the fullness. He said he pleased the Father that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in him body. How can somebody interact with Jesus at such close proximity? And then he still passes the test of being the son of perdition. He draws our attention to the cry of Paul where he said, We should walk out our faith with fear and with trembling. I say this as a remark and a note to begin with because we are in a territory that is invested so much with the presence of the word of God and custodians of the mysteries of the kingdom and if we are not careful the things we have at our disposal will become the very reason why we will trivialize the very scarce spiritual commodities that is responsible for our transformation therefore we may begin to do so much but when we are away on the scales of eternal balances, we will discover that we are light. The worst thing that happens to a man is not death. I've heard a lot of quotes. But when I read the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13 verse 27, I now saw that it was possible to cross the borders of eternity. And when you arrive at the other side, where there is no room for making correction anymore, after you have done so mightily on earth, then God will tell you, away from me, walker of iniquity. <laughs> what, what have I done that passes the taste of being a walker of iniquity? I drank in your presence. I ate in your presence. How does drinking from your fountain and in your presence and walking in your presence translate to walking iniquity? transaction that is carried out in the presence of God, we pass the test of God. How does eating and drinking in your presence translate to walking in iniquity? So it is possible for a man, after having done so much, passing theological test, we now cross over to eternity and discover that everything he did was a waste. Because there is a law of eternal consolidation. And it is on the strength of that law that the potency of our Christian life can be defined. So when we see subjects like we have to look upon tonight, then we have to put away all the frenzies of Christianity, the euphoria, and settle down to look at the facts. What are the things that spirit judge? If God were to come and look upon your life today, what do you think he will look at? Have you checked the scriptures to find out the commodities in the spirit that you have as a, an ingredient in your work with God that the mortars are interested in. When a spirit comes to access your work with him, what are the things, what are the exact things he looks at? Have you taken time to check the scriptures to find out what are those things that 
pleases his spirit. Because when I begin to read the scriptures, most of the times, I get troubled. Because when I look at the Christianity that has been handed over to us and the things we celebrate, I discover that these things were byproducts in the days of the patriarchs. And when their lives were recounted and God came to judge the texture of their service, most of the things we hold so high were not realities that God even considered. Even though they are very important. I now discovered we need to look at our lives again and find out the direction that we should go. Life is too important. The, the stakes are too high to allow yourself to become an experiment. I refuse to be an experiment. I refuse to be. The stakes are too high. When you realize that the breath on your nostrils can be taken away, and then the moment it is taken away, you appear in a place where they begin to judge every thought in your heart. Every action you ever carried out, every word you ever spoke, is now weighed on the balances. Then I begin to ask God, how then is it possible to pass your test? You know, the scripture we are about to look at tonight is not necessarily for sinners. It is for those who are saved. That means to be honorable, to be useful in the hand of God, is not necessarily a function of eternal life. It means to be useful in the hand of God is not necessarily a function of the fact that you have Jesus. To be useful in the hand of God is what you have become on account of the Jesus that you have on your inside. Because the scripture was not written for sinners. In fact, from the, the, first, the verses before 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21 that we'll be considering tonight, Paul had to first of all compare us with the Gentiles before he began to talk to us. Because if we are not careful, we will be blown away. Did you notice while reading your Bible that it is the church that manifested the highest gift of the Spirit that were called babes? You know, I didn't come to say so much. Well, just in case you came to see power and revival, sorry I will disappoint you. I, I want us to talk brotherly talk this evening. So that as you go home, you will sit down and contemplate your life once again. Those days where the father sat down for three days and they were checking the things that were important. We don't have them anymore. Now we come, we judge, we look at a lot of parameters. How is it possible for a man to dwell in the midst of fire, yet he is carrying addiction for many years? How is it possible for a man to come and move in the power of God? Yes, he's a puppet. Yet he's a puppet in the hand of the devil. What is the intelligence that is informing perversion in our generation? How did the patriarchs guide against this kind of demonic intelligence? That in their days, their manifestation rested comfortably on the foundation of their quality and work with God. How is it possible now that we can have manifestation yet we don't have depth? We don't have foundation. What is the intelligence informing the perversion? Is it possible now that some of the things we do are even facilitated by spirits that are not the Holy Ghost? How is it possible that a prophet will stand up from the bed of immorality and then he comes to flow in word of knowledge? And then there's nobody in the environment to even discern. What even this prophet, nothing moves in his conscience anymore. What, what is going on in our generation? Sadhusa Varaj came to Nigeria and he came to cry. Because there is an army that is rising that will be fueled by the spirit of immorality. We are crying revival. Many are on fire, running from pillar to post. But when you check the texture of our ranking in the spirit you realize that many who are on the microphone burning, they are in one way or the other connected to the spirit of immorality. So before the revival begins, the very army that have been ordained by divine intelligence have already been compromised before the journey began. So you and I know that we, God wants to use us. You and I know that we are on fire for Jesus. But there is an infirmity in our soul that we cannot deal with. And we have come to a point where we feel that one day something will happen. 
So we are doing what we are doing. We come to church. We are so conscious about the people that will fall down. Listen, there is nothing wrong in manifestation. But why is it that the power of God that we wield nowadays have no authority to deal with the infirmities in our soul? How did the patriarchs do it? Let's look at the scriptures. What did Jesus look at? That he will come and consider Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and all the prophets. And then the very John that the Bible says, John did no miracles. Jesus will now say, no man born of a woman is greater than John. What was he looking at exactly? I don't understand. If I remember correctly, Elijah called down fire from heaven. What were the parameters that he was looking at? It means spirits don't judge the way we judge. <laughs> ah! What was he looking at exactly? I don't understand how John was more important than Moses. I, I, can't, I can't find it. I can't understand it. It was Moses that said, God will raise a prophet like unto me. According to stature and ranking in the spirit on account of the places where Moses entered in his walk with God. He understood that he was the one that mirrored the dimension of the Christos. He said, the prophet that you are waiting for, he will be like me. Do men talk like that? Yet, this one came with the lenses of the immortals. And then he said, there is none among the prophets that is greater than John. What were the parameters that he was looking at? I want to show us something today that borders on spiritual texture. Our Christianity doesn't have texture. We have manifestation, we have no texture. That's the crisis of the 21st century Christianity. Manifestation, no texture. Check your life, you understand what I'm talking about. Don't look far. At the age of 12, Jesus was a master of the Torah. At the age of 12, the Bible said he spoke with doctors of the law. He asked them questions they could not answer. He answered the questions. That means it was if it was a function of your ability to interact, interpret the scripture. If it was a, on the basis of revelation and rema, if it was on the basis of doctrinal exegesis, at the age of 12, Jesus was the best rabbi in Israel. Why did he wait for 30 years? Why would the ministry of three years rest on a foundation of 30 years? Texture, 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 texture. <laughs> you, you spoke in tongues for six months. And then the fellowship, as you did like this, people fair. The next thing you are lost. <laughs> texture. So Jesus stood up. And when he sent them out, he said, The prince of this world come to me. He findeth nothing. When the devil comes, he's not interested in your manifestation. He can create it. There is something the devil cannot create is the life of God. Any man that carries the life of God in his foundation, that man is a threat in the demonic realm. So Jesus built 30 years on the ground in order to carry out the ministry of what? Of three and a half years. Why was texture so important? People come from meeting, they fall down, they roll down, they cry for three days. And then they get up after two weeks, they go back to immorality. No. There's a crisis. There's a crisis. There's a crisis. Manifestation could not rest on texture. Jesus said, all that you have given me, no one, not one, not one is falling except the son of perdition. And the reason he's falling is that the scriptures might be fulfilled. How did he sustain so much texture? I want to show us something today that is at the center of Christian work. The molecule that defines the texture of your work with God. 
this is what the fathers knew and i will show you how their bible studies look like i will show you how that their bible study is different from ours you know there are three major kinds of bible study there is an informative bible study where you can gather information is very important because those informations become raw materials that the holy ghost breathes upon there's a revelational bible study where the mind of god is unveiled but there is also another level of bible study that only the holy ghost is the teacher in that class it's called transformational bible study that was the one the elders of old were masters of so everything they learned they became they manifested because they received the clearance to become their becoming was rather the clearance that gave them right to manifestation so concerning jesus the bible said he began of all that he began to do and to teach so when jesus talks about holiness is first of all his reality so if jesus talks to you about holiness you cannot but become holy the first day i met apostle warren was <laughs> He said when he speaks, he deposits God. His idea is not to educate you. You will be educated in the process. But he's interested in depositing God. So you may leave the meeting, you don't know what you heard. But things die. Appetites die. And as you leave the meeting, you discover you woke up in the night, you wanted to speak in tongues. Those are your friends that you gossiped with, you didn't feel like going to meet them again. Meanwhile, you don't know the verse of the scripture he used when he taught because the days when the patriarchs walked with God, the scriptures were not written, yet they were like God. <laughs> That's why the Bible said in Romans 15:4, it said the things that were written at all time, it said they were written for our learning, so that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. These men, the days when they lived their lives, they had not written, the Bible was not written. How did they know God? You, you try to quote all the scriptures, you follow the lines of exegesis, and then you recite it from your head, but your spirit is lean. We need to open the scriptures so that uh, I'm not lost in talking. You know, sometimes when you travel, you accumulate burdens. You accumulate burdens. Man of God wants us to talk about purging, so we have to keep it calm. If not, we will enter cloud nine and forget that we came for purging. That means the, the emphasis of this teaching tonight is for discipleship. Sunday is really for manifestations. And um, I'm not under pressure to... We will, we will look at the scriptures and then we will allow the Holy Spirit to minister to people. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 20. He said, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. And it says, some to honor and some to dishonor. He said, if a man therefore purge himself from this, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. What are the deeds that the man need to purge himself from? It first of all began from an error in spiritual understanding. In verse 18, that's where the Bible talks what the deeds are. He was citing particularly two persons, Hymenaeus and Philetus. He said, Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that there is no resurrection, or the resurrection is past already? And overthrow the faith of some. He said, nevertheless, the foundation of the law standeth sure. That means truth is not something that can be manipulated. So, the foundation of their error was predicated upon their enormous revelation. They have come to know so much that they decided to go ahead of the truth of God. And he did not only remain in revelation, he led to lasciviousness and ungodly lifestyle. And this is the crisis of revelation without the life of God as a solid base. These guys had gone too deep in their 
explanation of doctrines that they have not subjected their lives to the Holy Ghost to define. Have you heard people teaching about prayer, but they don't have a prayer life? These are the kinds of people. But because they do not subject themselves to the Holy Spirit, to drill them until prayer becomes their life, they think it's something they can say by vaporizable intelligence. So when they come, they talk anything they want to talk about prayer. And because it sounds logically correct, they think they are right. So these guys, to them, they don't understand that the resurrection is the foundation upon which the, the life of God rests. To them, resurrection is a teaching. So they come to teach it and they develop dogmas that suit the happenings in their day and time. So they became philosophical in their explanations. They became philosophical in their teaching until a point came when they said there was the resurrection is already past. They thought it was an error that was built on intelligence. But they didn't know that that error was powered by spirit. And over time, as they walked in the direction of that error, they began to drift away from God. So revelation became the undoing of that generation. And he said many lost their faith. He said, but... For you that are in the house, he said, the foundation of God standed sure. They that name the name of the Lord must depart from iniquity. That means revelation is not born from mental exertion. Revelation is born from obedience to the Holy Ghost. It is the area where the Holy Ghost has authority over your life that you can tap into truth in the kingdom. So he's telling you that the foundation of God, the standards of God, are not a function of mental knowledge. They are a function of obedience. He said, if you name the name of the Lord, begin your journey by departing from iniquity. When you depart, then your doctrine will be accurate. The degree to which you are separated from error through obedience to the Holy Spirit is the degree to which your teaching can be accurate. Teachings are not accurate because they are logically correct. Teachings are accurate because they were inspired by the spirit of truth. So that teaching is a witness to the reality of that spirit. But oftentimes, people who do not have a walk with God want to talk about God. So we have revelations hovering about. Some of them are even rebranded from other teaching. But there is no capacity to touch the texture of the soul. So you can hear many teachings on righteousness, but you wonder why you still struggle. Because they were born from the mind. They were not inspired of the spirit. So Paul began by saying, obedience is the foundation of accurate spiritual revelation. He said, they that name the name of the Lord should depart from iniquity. And then he went further. He now began to explain to us how that we are vessels in the house of God. And who we are does not matter. You may be gold, you may be silver. It doesn't matter. You may be wood, you may be earth. It doesn't matter. He said, what matters is the degree to which you are purged. That means honor in the kingdom is a function of purging. <laughs> you see, sometimes when you begin to teach spiritual truth, it violates phil philosophical teachings. For example, when the spirit says love, what do you think he's saying? It has nothing to do with emotion. Your emotion may be part of it because that's how you are designed. But when a spirit talks about love, he's talking about obedience. He's talking about sacrifice. So Jesus said, if you love me, he didn't say, tell me. I don't want to hear. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So every time you are obeying Jesus, you are actually saying, Jesus, I love you. But how many of us here wake up in the morning and say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And the guy is loving you, Lord, and is disobeying God. I love you, Lord. Then the angels will come and look at you and say, Who is this creature? <laughs> Jesus said, If you love me, the way to declare it is what? Keep my commandments. So every time you obey a spirit, you are making a very strong proclamation of love. The same way the Bible reveals to us that the key to honor is purging, sanctification. He said, The day a man begins to purge himself, whether he is at and there is gold. That day a spirit alights upon him. And he becomes relevant in the kingdom. Sanctification is the greatest molecule 
that defines spiritual accuracy. If a Christian have not embarked on the protocol of sanctification, his journey is still far. You may be a leader, you may be known. Let me tell you, in a move, when the move of God begins, it's easy to latch to that move and flow. This move of God that is coming, there are many people that we listen to a lot of messages and have something to say and become popular. But many will be popular at the expense of being rooted. So they have no root in God, but they are popular. By the time the crisis comes, they will float away like chaffs before the wind. Sanctification is that molecule that defines your essence in the spirit. The Bible said the day purging becomes your way of life. He said that day, even if it's only singing, you are singing in church, you will be more relevant to God than the guy who is talking to 10,000 people. Because there is a way spirit judge. You will not understand. Because there are many things that you can't communicate. Unless you become fused to the spirit that bets life. And it is that spirit that determines the texture and the quality of your work. I give an instance all the time. You may come for a service. And then I came to preach for 60 minutes. And then another lady came and sang for 5 minutes. And then the spirit comes into the service and wants to judge. Captured in the ordination of that lady is to activate gifts of the spirit through her voice. That means her voice, worship for her, is not just praising the name of the Lord and extolling him. Worship for her is a system in the spirit that has the capacity to host the dimensions of God. So every time she begins to worship, if she is accurate with God, what she creates in the spirit is a system of spiritual resonance. And on the strength of, this, of that resonance, everybody in that service is brought to a plane in the spirit where God can make contact with them. Even the ones that were weak and the ones that were strong. This now becomes an economy that is beyond the level of excitement. So the guy comes for the service, he doesn't even know whether God wants to use him. But the moment the lady begins to sing, his eyes open and he begins to see a vision. Now, somebody else may be in the service having no discernment because he or she doesn't know the song the lady is singing. It does not resonate with his emotion. So he feels that the worship was weak. Meanwhile, when that lady was singing, what the spirit ran was responding to was the energy that was coming from her. And on the strength of that energy, she creates a resonance. And many people enter into spiritual possibilities. But because that song is not a song that is sung in Zaria, you don't know the song, so you think the worship was not strong. You may even sit down and be doing like this. And then somebody else comes, and then he sings a song that all of us know. And that song can easily find the frequency of our emotion. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Then everybody begins. <laughs> and then you say, oh my God, oh my God. Then the spirit comes into the service. And then when the spirit begins to, che- begins to check, the guy who sang the song you did not know, resonated, created a resonance in the spirit. And many people will leave that service. They will think it's the impartation of the man of God. Meanwhile, that lady brought them to the realm of Mahanai. And as they leave that service, they discover they begin to walk in word of knowledge. They pray for the sick, the sick is healed. They may never even trace it to her in their lives. But the one that sang and they were excited, they thought something happened. Their emotions were only stirred. So men may judge by what they felt. But when the spirit comes to judge, he judges on the degree of consistency with ordination. The man of God may even come to preach that day and talk Bible from his head. But the only lady that struck a chord in the spirit is the lady that was able to create Mahanai. So when spirits judge, they judge you based on the degree to which you have the ability to bring the will of God on the scene. And the man that brings the will of God on the scene is the man that is useful in the hand of God. So, the Lord spoke to Moses. And he told Moses to begin to judge and to rate men by the system of the shekels of the sanctuary. And then he began to rate men by their abilities. In Leviticus 27, he said, if a man is between the ages of 20 to 60, let him be worth 50 shekels according to the rating of the shekels of the sanctuary. If a woman is between the age of 20 to 60, 
let her be worth 30 shekels. If a man is between the ages of 5 to 20, let that man be worth 10 shekels. If a woman is between the ages like that and he outlined all of that. Why was that written like that? Because their service to God was on the strength of the ability that God gave them. And in their dispensation, ability was a natural reality. So the man had, the, had more ability to bring the will of God to pass. Maybe it was a time of war. But when our dispensation came, Paul now began to show us a new rating. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul began to tell us a rating that was not captured in the Old Testament. It became according to the intentions of your heart. To what degree does your heart, your intentions, your motivation align with the will of God? So Paul is now telling you, it's not about what you can do. He said, when God comes to reveal that which is in the heart of man, then he will reward every man according to his works. So reward now was not on the basis of the intensity or magnitude of your work, but according to what was in your heart. So God had migrated from physical manifestation to intrinsic transformational manifestation. So what you do before a spirit judges it, it checks your heart. And this is where sanctification becomes the deciding factor. But unfortunately, we are doing so much, there are few that are aligned. We know a lot of Bible, but God is not here. We quote a lot of scripture, God is not here. This is where our greatest crisis is. He said, the man will purge himself. I thought it was God that will purge a man. Why would God ask me to purge myself? Can I purge myself? What was Paul talking about? He shifts you to the next layer. That sanctification is a function of yieldedness. I'm building something. In the next 20 minutes, I may shift, I may shift gear. But I needed to establish this little, little foundation so that Everybody will hear something. And if you go home, you will know. You can't deny it. When we talk sanctification, there are two layers. You separate from the world. And then you separate unto the Lord. A man separates from the world when he decides to rebel against sin and ask the Lord to become the defining factor of his life. But the moment you separate from the world, the only way to separate unto God is to yield to Him. When you yield to God, then God begins to redefine the texture of your soul. The texture of your soul cannot be touched because you studied the Bible, unfortunately. The texture of your soul cannot be touched because you prayed. And I will show you this from the scriptures. So you will know why you speak in tongues for five hours. And then you finish a retreat of 10 days, you find yourself struggling with lust. You know, they teach us, the things the fathers did, if they were to tell us their story some of the times, it will help us more. They tell you it's prayer and fasting. You have been praying and fasting for three years, but you are still bound by what you are doing. They tell you it's giving. You have been giving, but you are still epileptic in the hand of the devil. So you look, you look at your life, you are frustrated. You don't know what to do anymore. You allowed yourself for six months. You say, I will fast until God visits. And you fasted for three months. The day that fasting ended, the next day, the devil just sends that girl that have not spoken to you for two years. And she shows up and says, hmm, Titus. So you like this, you have forgotten me. And then you discover that your six months fasting have no texture to withstand and admiration from a lady you've not seen for two years. These are the crises most of us go through in the secret. You pray in tongues every day for three hours. And then after you have run that schedule faithfully for three months, you felt that, ah, I have statue, I have statue. And then you came out of the hostel and the first person you saw dressed in a very terrible fashion. And then instantly your, your soul alignment scatters. Now say, ah, this thing will be prayer again. <laughs> you don't know who to talk to. 
Because every other person is for me as if he's doing it well. Me, why, brother? <laughs> you see, pray you. You see, oh boy. Hey, I wish I was like this. You came for service. You saw the lady praying and crying. You say, Jesus, why not bless me with this body? You didn't know that that girl is repenting from. She just came from immorality. So if you receive that body, you'll be in trouble. <laughs> oh my God! I told them in UN, don't pray to receive another man's body. You don't know what the person is saying. Talk to God to furnish body in your heart. You saw the person, oh Lord, and then you say, cry. This sister loves the Lord, loves God. Love is not crying, you know. Love is obedience. Yieldedness is the cure of human affliction. But many are not yielded. The cure. This is not a matter of open this scripture, open this verse, open this verse. Open, no, no. It's yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. I will teach you how the Holy Ghost does it. And then we'll begin to pray. That's when I will show you the secret of the patriarchs. The secret of their lives. Why these men were able to receive a good report. Remember, it was not men reading their citation. It was God that read their citations from heaven. And God will bear witness that a man pleased him. God will bear witness that a man was faithful in all of his house. God will bear witness. What if God were to speak about you in the public? If God wants to speak about me now, say, please say it in the bedroom first. Because many times when God came to speak, they were heavy rebukes. But this man, God spoke about them in the open theater of human existence, of all generations. And he said, this one was faithful. This one was, was honorable. He said, this one feared me. This one was obedient. What, what did they know? What did they know? What did they do that we are not doing? Remember, all of us are praying. Remember, all of us are studying the word of God. What then is that factor that distinguishes us? All of us attend great meetings. We go for revival meetings. We also minister in revival meetings. From the moment we say, Jesus, everywhere is on fire. But what is the crisis? The guy comes to worship God with a trumpet. Everybody is on the floor. Everybody is weeping. Himself is weeping. But he leaves that place. His heart is decaying. Texture. What? How does God deal with the matter of texture? When a man begins to yield to God, then God brings a syllabus. It's called the transformational syllabus. And that's what I will share with us briefly this evening. Then we'll pray. I told you, I want us to pray. And the kind of prayer we are praying today is not a prayer of encounter. It's not a prayer of manifestation. It's not a prayer of blessings. It's a prayer of becoming. So that the plagues that are rooted in our hearts will be uprooted. A point came in my life. I pursued all the men of God I revered. And I made sure they laid hands on me. But I still had crisis. And now discovered that okay. There is a place of impartation. But transformation is not one of it. I had periodic prayer sessions. I prayed periodically. But things were still wrong in my soul. I now discovered that prayer alone was not a factor. I studied scriptures, I crammed scriptures, I could quote, memorize them. But there was still crisis here. I now discovered the word of God, reciting it, is not a cure in this matter. That was when I discovered that the only cure was the presence of the Holy Spirit. And only men who are yielded can walk into that presence. That's where human affliction is removed. And how does the Holy Ghost take men to his presence? These are the things that we need to know. If you look at the life of the patriarchs, they began their journey with God with encounters. It's not this one we come, we receive two, three words of knowledge, and then we, we talk about it for five years. No. It's not this one we hear a voice, and we talk about it for six months. These men had no scripture they were reading. Every time God spoke to them, it was God talking to them directly. So the Rema word you receive once in a while, that was what they were living by every day of their lives. 
The visions you see once in a while, that was what they had continuously. Can you imagine a man like Noah? God will reveal so much to him that the whole dimension of the ark he was supposed to build. He had all the dimension, the woods, the length, the breadth. Such level of continuous and progressive vision in order to define the essence of his life. Where you are going with God today, how many visions have you received? Maybe God spoke to you five years ago that you'll be an apostle. And since then, God, God has not appeared to you. That's what you are working with. Then this is a man that God told him the beginning to the end of his life. The ark was what defines his relevance in eternity. He had all the dimension from the beginning to the end. You imagine a man like Moses met God with a, by encounter. He began with encounter. And then he will, God will give him a narrative of everything that will happen. And every time Moses doesn't understand, all he needs to do is to turn back and go to God. And God will say, go and do this. People were discussing with God every day. But those were not the things that define who they were. Because when God came to speak about them, He never spoke about their manifestation. He never spoke about their encounters. He never spoke about their visions. Go and read Hebrews chapter 11. When the Bible was speaking concerning Abel, the Bible said He gave, He offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. When He spoke about Noah, He said, When God spake, Noah moved with fear and built the ark. He never spoke about the technocracy, the mastery, the intelligence in creating the ark. Imagine we now, if I come to this service and I do like this, big, 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 I begin to give word of knowledge. I do like this, these people go down. You will see the beauty and the excellence in the administration of the gift of God. So when the guy was building the ark, that was the beauty in administering the gift of God. Because in his day, the zenith of the move of God was the building of that ark. So he built it with the best architectural intelligence. It's just the way you flow in word of knowledge today and it's beautiful. You move in the power of God, it's beautiful. But when God came, he didn't speak about the skill in building the ark. What God emphasized that brought witness to his life was his reverence for God. When God spoke about Abraham, Abraham entered the city that he was going to by word of knowledge. No marks given to him, no direction. He walked with the Lord until he found that city. So every day in Abraham's life was continuous and progressive word of knowledge. But God didn't speak about the word of knowledge. It was Abraham's obedience that brought him relevance with God. This is why I told you when spirits come to check and evaluate, what do they look at? If you were Noah, you would think God is so impressed because you created an ark, ark that fitted the dimensions. But when God came, it was God was looking at reverence in his heart. How did Noah get there? The life of Noah became a revelation of what accurate service we mean for eternity. So till tomorrow, any man that serves God without reverence cannot pass the test of the immortals. The reason they are called patriarchs is not because they came first. Because if it's because they came first, Adam's name would have been the first there. But it was not about who came first. It was about the pathways in the spirit that they pioneered on account of their work with God. So these guys pioneered different dimensions that became portals through which you and I will walk into. So today, this preaching and preaching, no matter how intelligent it sounds, even if I open all the scripture, it will not move a spirit until I do it with reverence. So in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 28, it said we should serve God with what? We should present our service through reverence, fear, trembling. That's what spirit is judged. Service without reverence will never pass any test. How did this man get into that level of knowledge? The Bible will speak concerning a man. And he will be pointing parameters that God considers. Are those parameters in your life? How did they know these things? How did they know it? If we know how they know it, I will begin to walk our lives like that. You may discover that, yes, word of knowledge may be sharp in your life. But what will be heavy in your life will be fear. So when you are moving in word of knowledge and people are clapping, you are telling God, have mercy. Lord, am I right? Lord, show mercy. Lord, show mercy. So you are doing what you are doing with fear and trembling. People are looking at the excellence and the beauty. 
But you know that what defines your stand with God is that reverence that has been wired into your spirit. You may be ministering in songs and people are falling, things are happening and they are saying this guy is anointed. But you know that your greatest molecule is the heart of love. So every time you go there, all you are doing, you are just loving the Lord. You don't know how people get to fall down. You, you were just loving the Lord. Somebody may look at you and think it's the kind of song you are singing. Or it's the way you tweak your voice. And then the person begins to tweak his voice like that. Or is worshipping God and doing the same gesticulation that you do. But the more he does it, the more people are looking like this. Meanwhile, you, you have understood that that parameter that the Spirit of God alights upon is your heart for him. So every time you carry the microphone, you let loose. You just pour yourself onto the Lord. But how you got to know that yourself will not understand? How? It is transformational Bible study. You may come, you are sharing the word of God and people are looking at, how does this guy know these scriptures? How does he open these truths? How does he do this thing? How? How? They think it's by the concordance and the Bible apps that you have. So they come to your house and collect all the Bible apps you have. They even ask you, when do you read the Bible? You say, okay, well, because there is noise, I'm a busy person. I wake up by 1 a.m. They begin to read by 1 a.m. So when they wake up by 1 a.m., they sleep till 4 a.m. And they say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Meanwhile, every time you stand there, what happens to you is that there is a portal that opens in your spirit. And then you flow by inspiration. And that inspiration does not flow through you just because you came to share the Bible. That inspiration flows through you because there are definite demands that the Lord has on your life. The more you keep it, the more that inspiration is open. So they may not know that for you, you have made a covenant with your eyes. Why will you look upon the virgins? So, so long as you don't look upon the virgins, every time you carry the scripture, it opens like a portal. The guy doesn't know that the secret is not because you study. Now, it is very important to study. What I'm teaching you is not a bit to violate principles. Principles are the heaviest molecules of human work with God. But until his principle is, is breathed upon by the life of the spirit, it becomes a body. You stand there because your eyes cannot look upon the virgin. So the law of your life is a fear of God. Somebody else, the law of his life is his quickness to respond to God. The moment God speaks, he takes off with trembling. So every time God speaks, he may... I heard the story about Benson Dahosa. He was in, in the U.S. the first time he traveled. Living in a, a very tight place in Benin. And then he was with T.L. Osborne and some other ministers. And somebody called him and said, Take, he took him to three locations and told him to pick any house he wanted. That they will allow him to pay for a long period of time. He won't even feed it. And then he picked the best. He said when they took him to the first place, he said, we'll pick this house. The man said, wait first. See the second one. When he came to the second one, I said, I'm not picking the first one again. I'm picking this one. The man said, wait first. He took him to the third location. I said, I'm picking this one. The man said, okay, this is better. And then he picked the house. And that night when he went to sleep, God said, if you take that house, I will kill you. Leave now. He went around 2 a.m. in the morning and woke the man up and said, I want to go. He said, why? He said, God, we kill me. He said, ah, are you okay? He said, I want to leave now. The man said, what's wrong with you? How about the house? He said, God said, I shouldn't take it. What do you mean? Are you all right? He said, I am going now. He went and woke his wife. They argued till 5 a.m. in the morning. The wife said, she's not going anywhere. They... <laughs> The man left his wife in the U.S., carried his bag, went to the airport. This woman stayed back. And he returned to Nigeria. So you see him, you may think faith for him is because he meditates on scripture. All of us, we meditate on scripture. But there is something God looks at in his life. His quickness to respond in obedience. So you may do every routine that Benz in the Daosa does, but you will never see his manifestation. That's why I told you it's not about prayer. Prayer is part of it. It's not about study. Study is part of it. But there are things that the Holy Ghost weaves into your soul that becomes the defining parameter of your destiny. For many, is the fear of God. The day the fear of God dies, you will keep doing what you are doing, but you have no result. That's why when God judges, He doesn't judge the result. He judges that thing that you have with Him. Because that thing you have with him is what defines you. But this is what the Lord don't have. And that's why our texture dies. The guy begins ministry with fear. He doesn't move until God speaks. But now, when he speaks, 50,000 people hear him. So he's now saying, ah, there's need for excellence in ministry. That is very correct. 
But the day excellence takes the position of the fear of God that was the fulcrum that defined your work with God. That day, the texture is lost. And this is the crisis of many believers. The guy starts ministry. God tells him, pray in the night. Your key is night prayer. He was faithful to it until God began to announce him. And then it became difficult. Because he went to preach, he had five invitations. He preached, he came back, he was tired. So that obedience was lost. He doesn't know that the moment the obedience was lost, even the utterance he has that he thought was a killer, that utterance will die. The guy goes to a point and then he loses the things that define his work with God. The patriarchs, their work with God was based on that parameter that the Holy Ghost revealed to them in the days of dealing. And even until they became old, it was their defining moment. So the Bible will speak concerning Enoch. He said the time when it was right for him to be taken. He spake and he said, I please God. That thing that he had with God, he didn't lose it until he was old. But if we look at our life today, we have truncated what we began with God. That was our greatest security. That's why the church in Ephesus had so many manifestations. But when Jesus came, he said, I have something against you. Go back to your first love. What is that thing that defined your work with God? That now because of fame, because of influence, you are beginning to lose it. That is why the texture of your Christianity will be watered down. The more you grow with God, the lighter you will become. The more you grow with God, the weaker you will become. And men become mighty. Men that demons could not walk around their corridor. When they were two years in the law, now they are 30 years in the law that demons dwell on their inside. What is the difference? Once upon a time, the devil dreaded them. If they were somewhere praying, the devil would not come there. But now, even while praying, the devil comes to reveal thoughts to their hearts. The devil fights them in the place of prayer. What has gone wrong? They have lost that molek. And the only way the Holy Ghost brings us to that point where we walk perpetually in those dimensions, it is by the technology of yieldedness. It's a teaching syllable that only the Holy Ghost knows to teach. A man can show you scripture. A man can bring you revelation. But that dealing of God upon your life it is your responsibility to preserve it when the Bible said if we purge ourselves what the Bible was telling us is not to wash yourself of sin it is the blood of Jesus that washes you of sin what the Bible was saying when you purge yourself is your effort and consistent you deadness to that dictate of the Holy Spirit that was the defining factor of your life and destiny if you have lost it then you have altered the protocol of transformation and your texture will be weak. Even if you are made of gold, you will no longer be relevant. Because every time you come to speak, the reason you are able to bring heaven on the scene is not because you were intelligent. It's not because you were skilled. It's not because you were gifted. All of this are a part of it. But the thing that God looks upon is that thing that he built into your soul. What is it God built in your soul that you are losing? For Abraham, I told you, God began with them through encounters. But their life did not continue with encounters. Their lives continue with obedience. We will begin with obedience and then we turn into encounter and we destroy obedience. That is why we become light feather. You come to church today, you say, Lord, speak. How many people have seen? 50 people have seen. They have seen a vision, they have seen an angel. They call you, they say, I was praying. Light appeared from the wall and stood and looked at me. Ah, my hand began to burn. My hand, my hand. And that my hand began to burn becomes what is the greatest concern of his life. Meanwhile, when he began with God and God was raising him, his concern was fear. He will never move when God speaks. And even if he has moved, if God speaks, he stops. That guy can go back publicly and apologize to everybody because he had the fear of God. But now, the Holy Ghost said, go back and tell that brother, he said, is it not that guy that, uh, that guy serves me now? How can I apologize? I'm the president. God is not dealing with you as a president. He's dealing with you as a servant. That is boy. That is son that he has always worked with. So when Jesus came to Nicodemus, he didn't bother whether he was a Pharisee. He didn't bother whether he was a member of the Sanhedrin. All Jesus bothered about was he is a man. So God will always continue with you like that. How do we purge ourselves by yielding? Let me tell you the story of Abraham in five minutes and then I'll round up. The Bible said God had appeared to Abraham in the hall of the Chaldees and had given him all the commandment about his life. You know, the way God spoke to these men, sometimes when I look at it, I wonder, how will God speak to a man and tell him everything to the end and all the promises of his, of his life? God reveals all of them to him. God spoke to Abraham, told him what to do, 
and then told him what he will do for him. All the blessings that God wanted to give Abraham, he narrated all of them to him before he started. Imagine if God came to tell you today that uh, if you walk with me, a point will come when I will make you become the man that chooses the American president. If you walk with me, every year, the least you will have is one billion. Maybe God also understands that our generation have become too fleshly. We pursue him for what we can gain. So if he told us that, it will become a distraction. He gave Abraham all the promises. Leave your father's house. No, leave your nation, leave your kindred, leave your father's house. And I will bless you. In blessings I will bless you. He said all the generations of the earth shall be blessed. He said they that curse you shall be caught. Imagine the immunity that came with it. And then after God told him everything he wanted to do for him. God now introduced the code of obedience. And God began to carry him. God began to carry him. So what we bring Abraham into that level of relevance was his continuous followership of that code that God gave to him. I call it the code of the supernatural. And when I say supernatural, I'm not talking about manifestation. I'm talking about accuracy with God. Manifestation, part of it. The approval of God, part of it. So for Abraham's life until he was old and stricken in age, he followed that code. He followed that code. Apostle will teach us and say, when God spoke to Abraham and gave him the whole promises and Abraham was willing to obey, he said God carried him. And Abraham walked with God and went to Sikkim. And when he went to Sikkim, he passed through Sikkim to Moreh. And from Moreh he went to Ai. And from Ai he went to Bethel. He said, what is Sikkim? The word Sikkim means shoulder. That's where you carry body. Those days they don't carry load on the head. They carry it on the shoulder. And then the word more means teacher. That means the Holy Ghost teaches by body. That's what I want to explain to us this night. And it's the story of Abraham. All his life, everything he learned from the Holy Spirit, he learned by experience. So when you go to the Bible and you read about obeying God, and then you come out of the room, you now go to your lecture hall, the Holy Ghost now say, that way 200 naira you have, give it to Brother Austin. If you don't obey it, the Bible you read, you didn't understand it. You may understand the English language, but you don't understand the essence. So you read, to obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rams. And then you carried it, you came for prayer meeting. And when you were leading prayer, you say, to obey is better than sacrifice. And then people were doing like this. And then you left. <laughs> and then when you went to him, the Holy Ghost gave an instruction. And then you couldn't obey. You didn't know that scripture, even though you quoted it and power moved. So what will happen to you is that you will go to eternity and you will be weak, you will be small with all your manifestation. That's what Jesus meant when he said, away from me. There's manifestation, but there's no texture. Because we don't learn the ways of the Spirit. We don't yield to the Holy Spirit and we don't follow him. The scriptures are sweet until there is need to obey. The scriptures are beautiful until it begins to play out in our lives. We stay at the level of the beauty of scripture. That's why we are shallow. We don't allow the scripture to be walked into us when the Holy Ghost comes. Because every time a man ventures out to learn about the spirit, that spirit will show up if it's consistent. But when that spirit shows up, will you be yielded? That's what will define who you are. The texture of your work with God is not a function of how much you know. The texture of your work with God is not a function of how much you can do. The texture of your work is how much you have become on account of your yieldedness. For Abraham, he became a ranking personality because he went through Sikkim and More. And when he, uh, uh, when he finished that syllable, his life changed from AI to Bethel. AI is a pile of stone. There was no order. That's why you come for meeting, you see the guy. There is so much gift of the Spirit, but you can't find the life of God. That's an AI man. He didn't pass through Sikkim and More. You come, you see things happen, but that's an AI personality. If that man goes through the burden technology of the Holy Ghost's doctrine, a point will come when he will become the house of God. So every time that man speaks, heaven backs him up. And it is God himself that will bear witness for that man. It is no longer about what he knows anymore. It's about the spirit that he can witness to. His life becomes a theater through which God can be seen. Every time we move in the gifts of the spirit, the idea is not to show what we can do. The idea is because there is a God in the spirit realm that wants to manifest among men. 
And if you manifest the gift apart from the essence of that God, you have wasted God's time. Because God does not invest in men to make a show. God invests in men because there is a purpose that he wants to reveal. The eternal purpose of God is for Jesus to become the center and circumference of human existence. So when you flow a word of knowledge, how much do people become like God? When you preach your intelligent doctrine, what does it do to the heart of the men that hear you? Peter spake and the Bible said they were caught in their heart. I thought he was speaking Aramaic. Why did they not hear him in their head and they were caught in their heart? Because he was talking God. He was not talking the doctrine. Brothers and sisters, I came this evening to call us into yieldedness. That is the only way we can become vests unto honor. We are not honorable because of our hairstyle. We are not honorable because of the suit we wear. We are not honorable because of the impression we successfully create before men. We are honorable because the spirit that we represent says so. And that spirit will only speak if we have truly become yielded to him. The Christianity we practice today is a Christianity of rebellious people. The rebellious people. We know how to make it happen without the Holy Spirit. We know how to make it work without the Holy Spirit. And that's the difference between our work with God and the work of the fathers. The fathers, even though they have so much ability, they will never move. Why will David, who is a king, need to consult the urine and the tumim before he makes a move? It was not about his strength. It was about the will and the mind of the father. That is how these guys were trained. The Holy Ghost could count on them at every time of their lives. Because those days, they waited on God until God broke them. Nowadays, we pray until God begins to give instruction. The guy says he will do everything for God. He's going for the prayer meeting every day. Until God says, leave that sister. And then prayer meeting ends. He wants to serve God and do everything. Until God says, leave Zaria and go back to your village. Because the gospel they taught him is a gospel that we have to be in Lagos and prosper. There's nothing wrong with prosperity. But if we teach prosperity outside of the dictates of ordination, it will become witchcraft. Because there's no prosperity you can teach John the Baptist. The only way he can reveal the Messiah is to live in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. If you make John the Baptist live in the palace, you have excused him from his ordination. So prosperity cannot infringe on the peculiarity of God's dealing upon your life. That is why even though we teach on the altar, the syllabus that the Holy Ghost teaches us by body is the most important syllabus of our life. This is where most of us violate God. This is where most of us violate our calling. This is where most of us violate our ordination. And we don't know why we don't amount to much with God. We know everything in our head. We practice everything we were taught. But we don't follow the voice of the Holy Spirit. We don't follow the whispers of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost may not say anything contrary to what you are taught. But what the Holy Ghost tells you is the compass of your destiny. The Bible said Abraham went through seeking and he came to Moreh. Did you notice that after Abraham was done, the first thing Abraham learned from that school was not how to prosper. The first thing Abraham learned from that school was the system of altars. Because in, 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 in Genesis chapter 12, from verse 7, the Bible said, The moment he left Sikhen and Moreh, he said he built an altar to the Lord that appeared to him. So for Abraham's life, the secret of his greatness was the things he learned in the days of dealing. And the first thing Abraham showed you and I that he learned was not the wisdom of prosperity. It was not the excellence of ministry. It was not the strategy of making it in life. It was the wisdom of altars. And that was where Abraham dwelled. You cannot understand the story of Abraham until you have understood the altars that were littered in his path of, of, of pilgrimage. Abraham was a man of altars. And that was what even preserved his heritage forever. Jacob would have violated everything Abraham labored for in his life. Except that Abraham was able to learn the syllabus of altar when he was taught in secret. It was that altar that he planted that became the thing that rescued his posterity. Many of us, the Holy Ghost whispers, but we violate him. Everything we have been taught is correct. We will keep doing them. But there is one thing we need to add in order for our work with God to have texture. If not, the day we come, you will think you love God until you begin to receive seeds of five million. And they come in very periodic frequencies. That's when you think that ministry is excellence. There is excellence in ministry, but ministry is not excellence. Ministry is the life of the Spirit flowing out through a man. And the only way that life can flow out through you is the degree to which you plug to that Spirit. Until the money begins to come, until the fame begins to come, that's when you will think ministry is about making people know that you have something. 
So you show up somewhere. God said, do this. Hey. No. The governor is here today. The guy came throughout the night. There was one song the Holy Ghost was, speak, was singing. Take me deeper. But every time he sings that song, he doesn't see power. Now he came for a meeting where the governor is around. And he, you know, something needs to happen. The Holy Ghost is still singing that song in his heart. But Kai, Kai, ministry now is about what people think. Did you not read the life of Saul? He said, when you were small in your own eyes, did I not make you big? So what even makes people honor you so much? It's not even how much you can do. I've seen great men of God came for meetings. The, the, the people cheered and ran. And then they came and said, God loves you. I just came to tell you the Lord loves you. And then when they left, people were still excited. Ah! Is this all this man came from America to tell us? They chartered the jet, brought you from America, and then you come, you say, Oh, you know, the Lord loves you. Um, and you will still honor them because honor is a spirit. This man knows how it works. So they don't care about what you have to say. The day saw began to care about what the people said. He lost it. The guy is teaching 10 people. Power is moving. He goes somewhere. There are 50,000 people for the first time. And the Holy Ghost says, calm down. He looks around. He sees 10 big pastors in that city. Those are 10 big invitations. He has been trusting God for 3 years for breakthrough. How can God set his stage now and want to humble him? He doesn't know that God is more interested in becoming than in manifestation. Because it is your texture that will travel with you to eternity. It is not the manifestations. The manifestation will be rewarded based on your texture. That's why he said when the counsel of the heart of man is revealed, that is when God is permitted to reward. If the counsel of your heart is not revealed, there is no reward for you. And many may not even be known and applauded in time, but in eternity they will be captains of thousands. I want to tell us tonight that every one of us have something the Holy Ghost is upon in our soul. We are all a project that God is working on. We go for those big meetings, we come back, that project is constant. We catch fire, we burn for months. The fire goes down, we catch other fire. The project is constant. That means what God wants to ride upon to make a difference in our lives is that project that is in our lives. For Abel, it was an excellent offering. For Noah, it was the fear of the Lord. For Abraham, it was quick obedience. For Moses, it was departure from Egypt. The Bible said he, he, he left the pledges of Egypt and chose to suffer affliction with God's people. What is the project God is running in your life that you are rebellious to? You hear quick messages, sound messages, intelligent messages. You have encounters, you have impartations. But what is that project? Did you not notice that that is the most constant thing in your life? Because that's what the Holy Ghost is sitting on. For your destiny to open. That particular dimension of God. That thing God is working on in your life to manifest. It only runs on the economy of that project that God is running. Some of us is humility that is the key to our breakthrough. We will apply these principles. They will work. But until God is able to break us, nothing will work. So for 10 years, God has been dealing with pride. 10 years! You were nothing. God was talking pride. Now you are grown. God is still talking pride. 10 years! The Holy Ghost is constant. You have seen 10 angels. You have seen 15 angels. You have had encounters. Your leg, your teeth are burned. You were praying. Even your teeth was on fire. But the Holy Ghost is constant on pride. That one, he will not shift ground. The reason is because he wants to make you. That's how. That's what God means when he's committed to a man. Some of us is lying, this tongue, for five years. Every time you violate it, the Holy Ghost must remind you. That's the only time where you lose your peace. It's a statement that that is the pork room that will open your life. Some of us is lack of fear. The reverence of God is no longer there. God wants to teach you tonight. And this teaching, as you step out of this meeting, it will become intense. Because that beacon of light that is in your spirit, that the devil is, is trying to press down, the Holy Ghost will come upon it again. 
And as you leave, you will find the Holy Ghost becomes strong on that stuff. Forget this doctrine of every time you have a forgiveness, God will forgive you. There is nothing wrong with it. It is correct. Because we are forgiven in Christ. But our relevance in the kingdom is not based on forgiveness. Our relevance in the kingdom is based on our degree of yieldedness to become. God will forgive you because he doesn't want to violate his fellowship with you anymore. But what you will become is what will determine who you will be in eternity. And remember, God judges us and looks at us and relates with us more because of eternity. It's not because God doesn't want you to be big in time. It is his pleasure to bless you to be mighty. But the wise understand that everything God gives them in time is a resource for relevance in eternity. I want us to pray the next five minutes. I came here to bring us a quick reminder. I didn't know what the Holy Ghost did to your heart to make you bring people to a point where they will be reminded that there is a need to be purged. There is a need to come to the Lord again. We have the revival meetings, we have the power meetings, we have the prosperity conferences, but there is a need to be purged again. I don't know why God brought that to your heart, but the key to purging is your yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is the only one that knows where He will take you to, that your pride will be chiseled. The Holy Ghost is the only one that knows where He will take you to, that your tongue will be sanctified. The Holy Ghost is the only one that knows where He will take you to, that your heart will be broken and modified to be able to host His dimension. These ones are not teaching that men can bring. And that's why when you hear, is you, when you go out there that the Holy Ghost begins to walk with you. We may teach you in the congregation, but the Holy Ghost teaches you from your heart. So you can be with your friend and the Holy Ghost is talking. You can be with your classmates, the Holy Ghost is talking. It is your degree of yieldedness that will define who you will become. You want to be a vessel of honor, you must be a yielded vessel. Because until you are yielded, you cannot be sanctified. The Holy Ghost will only walk on you to the degree of your yieldedness. Can we bow our heads and pray? Next two minutes, talk to the Lord quickly. I know most of you are called of God. Most of you have, you sense the calling of God upon your life. I know. I know most of you know a lot of things. There's nothing. Zaria is a ground of revelation. Zaria is a ground of power. It's a ground of manifestation. So when you come to a place like this, you don't labor to do so much. Even the atmosphere can create a lot of things if you take advantage of it. But where are the men that have texture? Where are the men that will rise? That spirits can bank on? Where are the men that God can come and say this one fear me? This one love me? This one obey me? Where are those men? Those are the men that God commits eternal, eternal responsibilities to. You know the areas where you have been rebellious? Can you talk to the Lord about it? Can you drop it at the feet of the master? Is it your tongue? Is it your thoughts? Tell the Holy Ghost, if you will take me through second, I will follow you. Yes. Those places I've run away from, I will follow you there now. I will follow you. Those places he carries you to that you say, no, it's too hard. That's where transformation is. He said, if you go through the fire, you will not be burned. So to know faithfulness, you have to journey with him through fire. You go through the waters, you will not be drowned. Talk to him now. Tell him, commit yourself, commit those areas to him. Commit it to him, commit it to the Lord. This is not that service where we jump. This is that service where we, we are sober. We check again, we check, we check, we check. And you don't have to be emotional about it, you have to be deliberate about it. Principles are very important, 
But spirit life makes the difference. So that your skill does not ultimately become a waste. So that your giftings does not ultimately become a waste. So that your graces does not ultimately become a waste. And the investment of God in your life does not become a waste. In eternity, that God will look upon you and say, Well done, my faithful servant. You need to yield to the Holy Spirit. You need to yield to the Holy Spirit. Talk to Him. Talk to Him. Be deliberate. Be deliberate. Make commitments. Spirits begin to walk from the point of commitment. Talk to the Lord now. Talk to the Lord. I know some of us are leaders. Some of us are ministers. Some of us already own and run ministries for God. But what is the project of God on your life? To what degree are you committed? Don't just focus on growing the ministry. Watch jealously that dealing of God on your life. Because at every level there's a layer of that dealing. He said, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Therein. God may be dealing with fear. There's a level of fame and stardom you enter. It will become stronger. God may be dealing with pride. There's a level of fame and stardom. God will never leave that syllabus. That project is an eternal project. For Abraham, he continued until he was old and stricken in age. Old and stricken in age. That's why when God wants to talk about the story of a man, he doesn't narrate his life, his life. He picks that project of his life. That project that was the dealing of his life. If God touches it, every other part of that man resonates from that frequency. So for Abel, the moment he called offering, he had spoken the story of Abel's life. For Noah, the moment he called reverence, he has told the story of his life. For Abraham, the moment he called obedience, he had told the story of Abraham's life. What is that thing God will mention about your life that will represent the story of your life? What is it? Is it the fear of God? Is it prompt obedience? Is it humility of the spirit? Is it yieldedness to the spirit? For Moses, God mentioned faithfulness. And faithfulness represented the story of Moses' life. Faithfulness. He said he was faithful in all of the house of God. What is that word that defines you? Jesus said on that day, He will give every man a new name that no man knoweth. It's a function of the factor that defines your life. Manifestations are important. We need it to conquer our world. But who we are in the spirit is an intimate reality with God. What will God mention that will define your life? What defines your life? What defines your life? What is that spiritual substance that defines your life? Until you have it, you don't have a life. You only have breath on your nose.